Um, so I think, I think there's probably an overwhelming theme of you know, taking back power is maybe a strong word, but taking back power from uh, governments and corporations, whether that's with the data or in other aspects of, of the radical exchange. And I think, esp especially within the identity space, um, it's, th there's a lot of different ways that we can try and solve the problems of identity. So there are lots of different problems. And identity, as you've heard today, is very multifaceted. Um, there's a lot of different ways about thinking of identity. It's not just about your German passport, for example. There's, there's a lot more depth to it. Um, so what, what we're going to talk about here is quickly a little bit of an introduction from these wonderful people on this panel. Um, and maybe not too much in detail about them, but a little bit about the problem that they specifically focus on in the identity space. And then we can kind of jump into the questions with a lot more detail as we go forward. So maybe Fabian can start, because he's the most controversial. Um, yeah, so I'm, I'm from the Ethereum space. Um, my background kind of like uh, was um, building the, the, the front end and the develop tools for the Ethereum ecosystem. Um, so that's mainly the MIST browser, the Ethereum wallet, Web3.js, and ERC20 then later, and ERC7 to 5, and that's kind of why I'm here. Uh, um, I'm not French, you know, my, my name is misspelled, so don't write it down. <laughs> um, and so my, my interest in what I'm working on basically since one half years is actually a dedicated network for more mainstream focused applications. Uh, and on-chain identity is a very big piece because on-chain identity or on-chain profiles and smart contract based accounts basically allow us to have an e easier UX. And the biggest issue you have right now, you know, using anything with blockchain, that it requires you to remember 20 seed words or 12 seed oh. words. Uh, or, uh, um, you know, back up your accounts and then um, basically always have different accounts for different devices you use and never basically be able to easily use the same account from different devices, which basically makes people not use it at all. <laughs> or have like this one, one account, you know, the, the MetaMask account they maybe use somewhere or not. So my, my main interest is in actually making these on-chain uh, interactions Easier, I think we can make Web3 easier than Web2.0 in terms of like how we interact. Um, but that's just mainly the smart contract uh, world, what I'm interested in, and more like the kind of public uh, profiles you create. Cool. Paula, maybe you want to go next? Yes. Um, I am a researcher at Democracy Foundation. We are a nonprofit organization that is researching for the past five years internet and um, democracy and identity plays a big role in every voting system so we've been deepening our research in trying to understand how can we create a civil proof identity and by that I mean um, an identity protocol that can prove that the entity the digital entity behind uh, that the person behind an, an entity is a human and not a bot but also that this human is not controlling more than one account so that you can have a domain, an organization in which you know that each uh, of the members corresponds to one human. So this is a big challenge and uh, we, are, we have more questions than answers so far, but uh, we've been looking at the different approaches, the different angles so far in, in approaching this problem and there are two basic models that, that we're looking into this space. One is the web of trust, where you have different nodes that are vouching for each other, and you can have um, uh, token economics that is attached to this, where people uh, maybe stake tokens onto each other. These stakes can um, serve as a bounty for network policing, so if you're able to prove that a node is uh, duplicate, then maybe you get those those uh, tokens. So this would be um, the web of trust model. The, the, the one key issue here is that we don't have yet ways to measure uh, the honesty of the participants. And, and another uh, issue that, that we have is, another, sorry, angle that we have is the angle of machine learning resistant proofs. So the idea that you can have a Turing test, a test where you, you're proving that you're a human and not a, a robot, 
and that this Turing test uh, involves doing an activity that only a human could solve. And so a, a really great example of that is the IDENA network where um, you have those tests and every single node in the network has to do it at the same time. So they, uh, with that, they ensure that there are no duplicates in the system. So we're looking at these different approaches and trying to understand how we can combine them and offer different modalities of, of, um, of identity validation. Again, mo more, uh, more questions than answers, but a good principle that we're abiding here is that in identity, you, you don't necessarily have to verify uh, the identity itself, but try to aim to verify just that a member has uh, the right to access an organization or a technology. So this is um, a bit of what, what we're working on. So, um, yeah, I'm Pele from Uport. Uh, Uport, if you guys don't know, is one of the um, original SSI, self-sovereign identity um, platforms. It was always designed to be built and used with Ethereum, and it still is. We very much are believe that having a good, robust uh, identity framework is really important to be able to get uh, real blockchain applications working. Um, so we've been working on this for four years now. In the first three years, we spent a lot of time experimenting, iterating, making tons of mistakes, and hopefully trying to fix them. The last year, we, we, we felt that we were basically production ready. We have a scalable, self-sovereign identity framework here. And so the, now the next issue was like, how do we actually get people to use this? How do we actually create value here for people and businesses and everyone else to use. Um, so we, we really s stopped a little bit. We started really thinking way more about the philosophy of what it is that we're doing. And um, we talked with lots and lots of people all over the world, um, governments, banks, individuals, NGOs, etc. And we've been trying to come up with, with ways of being able to not try to redefine how people do, do things, but actually how, to we, how we, we can adapt our tech, like this self-sovereign identity tech, to the real world. And part, some of those things, for example, are uh, really looking at GDPR, for example. And you know, a lot of people look at GDPR as just another stupid regulation, governments, bah, all of that stuff. Um, but there's the basic concept with behind GDPR about data rights actually fits really well into this model. Uh, it was really interesting seeing Glenn's talk before because um, what we've been building essentially the last year is essentially, is, is what's, what Glenn was talking about with this graph of having, having these data elements that doesn't be necessarily belong to one person, but uh, it's part of a graph, right? So this concept uh, that that we now, in, we call it trust graph, and we're starting to launch all of this stuff out, pushing it into open standards and stuff like that very shortly. But it's about getting away from this idea of a, this very US focused libertarian idea that data is property, because it's it's not. All data belongs to multiple multiple parties. I mean, I'm sure there are exceptions. There is data that just belongs to me. But most, almost all data, as, as I think Glenn rightly pointed out, belongs to multiple parties. So this is what we've been, we've been focused on and also focused on how, how we can actually make this work in the real world with real and existing ecosystems. Because a lot of, a lot of the problem is, is identity can be used for very specific problems to solve it in certain ways. And maybe you can speak a little bit about um, verifiable credentials and bids because I think that, I mean, you can go into detail now, but it, it's, it's using existing infrastructure in the sense of government issued IDs to solve the problem in a slightly better way than we currently do. Maybe you can say a little bit about that for people that are interested and we can then jump into more detail about the reputation. And sure, sure. So, uh, so uh, just briefly, decentralized identifiers is, or DIDs, this is the latest buzzword that, uh, that 
that people are, are, are using now. It's, a, it's now a new W3 standard. If there are any standards police here, I don't know the current status, if it's officially a standard or what. I always scared because I get shouted down by people. No, it's at this and this level. But the DID standard is basically, it's basically finalized right now. And it's the idea of having a decentralized identifier. It's very e important to realize it's an identifier, not an identity. So an identifier could consist of many, many identifiers and the data that is tied into, the, into this, these identifiers. It, I have to keep trying to stop using the word the data that belongs to an identifier, but the data that is associated with, with these identifiers. Uh, verifiable credentials is a really good example of this kind of data. Verifiable credentials is where a government, for example, goes in and says, you know, you are a South African citizen, this is your passport uh, number, et cetera. Not worth much. <laughs> it's a cool country though. Uh, but the, the really important thing to understand about decentralized identifiers is that it kind of inverts the control from the traditional identity systems where the identifier is issued. So we have all of these identifier that's been given to us and being able to associate these with you know, with who we are, with our blockchain interactions, all of these kind of things is, is a difficult thing. So decentralized identifiers really allows you to take control and have these associations in to your different identifiers that you control rather than having to fit into all of these different silos. And the traditional identifiers are really, you can think of them as silos. I, I normally, I do a very philosophical talk about identity where I talk about uh, traditional identity silos, it's like the, the old um, Indian fable with the six blind men and the elephant. Each one touches one part, and like this is a tree, this is a leaf or rope or whatever, depending on which part of the elephant they touch. And that's really how identifiers, how identities are today. And decentralized identities really lets us take control. And when we want to, and only when we want to, present a much wider part of it. Yeah, so I think I, I think we could speak a lot more about those specific specific pieces, but I think let's as we're in the radical exchange space, let's focus a lot more on the sort of proof of human reputation score, scores and intersectional social data. Um, so maybe Fabian, you can say a few words on how you feel about reputation and and sort of the, its place in in our lives, how we can use it, and, and some ideas around how you can actually implement it. And I'm sure Paolo's gonna have a lot to kind of add on top of that. You wanna create a debate here, I mean. Uh, so, the, 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 the so basically my perspective on things is, um, we do need this kind of like decentralized identities, we need uh, our own data stores, we need different ways of how we can basically, you know, um, selective reveal information about ourselves. But I think there's a big space which is kind of left out when we're talking about any kind of uh, identifiers, which is kind of our public profiles. Right now, because th this is actually covered by Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and whatnot. But we need such a system also, and such a thing also in a uh, decentralized space. So we need to have like public profiles that are independent of any kind of platforms that we can uh, build reputation on top. And so on the one hand, so I think you know, if you have smart contract-based accounts that could become such a public profile, that's not only interesting for people, but it's also interesting for companies um, and for uh, organizations and so on. I mean, for example, if you look at the Ethereum Foundation, the Ethereum Foundation's official address is <laughs> it's like this initial uh, wallet they have where uh, the money got put in. Technically, that's the identity of Ethereum on chain. It just never did anything besides like cashing that money out. <laughs> it could have signed things with this, uh, uh, with some of the keys and so on. Um, so I think we need kind of like a better way of how we interact on chain. This could become public profiles. There is obviously the, the tricky part of if you put that, for example, on Ethereum, it definitely stays there forever. Even if you delete the smart contract, it will be in the past history that it existed. Um, I have some ideas about uh, that as well. Um, maybe, maybe briefly mention them so at least people have something to come and ask you about later. <laughs> I mean, so the thing is, I mean, this is actually something which I'm uh, quite um, a little bit, you know, like confused about why this is not actually a bigger topic in the blockchain space per se. So what we have is 
um, the GDPR. GDPR's biggest problem with blockchain is that if you combine, uh, you know, the GDPR rule, where mostly the 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 law to be forgot or the right to be forgotten is kind of like the biggest uh, blocker when it comes to blockchain. Um, that there's not much much more people thinking about. Okay, how can we add a blockchain pruning? And I'm not talking about state pruning. I'm talking about like creating checkpoints within the blockchain so that like newly coming nodes can actually sync from there. That would solve multiple problems. It would solve the way of how you sync up a, uh, a full node, and it would solve the, no uh, the the problem of the right to be forgotten because if a blockchain can forget the past but still be verifiable, and there are some ways to do that. You know, zero knowledge proofs would be one, some kind of decentralized agreement out ch around checkpoints is another. I mean, there are a lot of problems in the details, but I think it's possible and I think it's, it would solve a lot of these uh, GDPR related problems we have. And what you really care about in a blockchain is the current state. So what is the current state of things? Who has what, what is in my smart contract and you know whatever is the current state of the different smart contracts if you want to keep the past then you know store it locally the way of I mean how you can do that in the internet as well see archive.org you know you can just uh, scrap every website forever if you wanted to but it would kind of solve that bit conflict that when you have a public uh, profile on chain you could actually let it disappear after some time at least for most people. Um, so that that's kind of some ideas. And I think we can uh, talk a bit more uh, about that later. Yeah, because I mean, I think a lot of what we're speaking about is reputation and trust. And part of trust is the ability to know who you're speaking to. We, I mean, every identity conference, I always put up a cartoon about the dog. You don't, if you're on the internet, you don't know if you're talking to a dog. And I think it's overused but it's important for people to understand that and, and I think in in the same way that if we don't have these structures in place then you know if we don't have some proof of human we can't do governance properly we can't do voting properly and we can't really trust the content that is out there so yes um, yeah but when we when we discuss blockchain as the infrastructure for for identity, I think one of the main risks that people get very concerned about is having their data online, and, and especially if those uh, systems are widely used, there's a concern that people would not understand that they are, that when they are storing something on the blockchain, maybe there's, even if they encrypt the information, if, they, if the keys are compromised, then that information is public forever and there's nothing you can do. So searching for alternatives there, I think is important. Uh, I also think it's important to also consider ways to not put data at all um, and, and store it locally. And there are many great solutions in the, in the space for this already. Um, and still with those those concerns in mind, we need to search for, for solutions to be able to formalize humans. I think that Glenn is really summarized the issue best with blockchain networks today, which is that they formalize assets, but they do not formalize humans. And when you have such a system, then there's no way for you to, to have to have a democracy, basically, at the end of the day, assets are going to speak louder. And any kind of uh, governance procedure that we have right now in the blockchain space, this is a, a discussion within the blockchain space, ends up, uh, because you're authenticating members by, by their ownership of a specific token, then it's very common that at the end of a vote, you will have a member with a large quantity of tokens that will just subvert the vote in the direction in, in their uh, preference. So in order for you to have an alternative to that uh, and, and do actually democratic and not plutocratic governance, you need some way to formalize humans. But then we enter in the discussion, how do we do that while preserving privacy? It's, it's I think, a question that we should all be focusing on. I, I really like this, the idea of intersectional identity and that you don't necessarily need to, um, that you can have a multifactorial identity and you can disclose 
aspects of yourself uh, of yourself at will, how to um, how to reconcile that with also being able to have a registry where you know that all of the members are not duplicates and are real humans uh, is key. So you know, sol solving the, the the blockchain solved the double spend problem. Now we need to solve the double human problem on blockchains, <laughs> um, which is a, a big challenge. But if we do that, the reason why this is so promising is that then you can have social applications for blockchain networks. So you can have a universal basic income of cryptocurrencies for everyone who is authenticated as a, as a member. You can have democracies that can grow anywhere. Um, and, and this is really the, the challenge that will allow the social applications of blockchain networks. And we see the reason why we, we can infer this is also due to the fact that in, in the current traditional web, the entities that were able to, to arrive to create identity uh, credentials that had a consensus in the network, so these are Facebook, Google, who are able to provide us with, with credentials, they uh, created this trust layer on top of which people could organize, could create businesses, new economies were created, new social and new political movements were created. And if, the, if we don't have this uh, trust layer for identities in blockchain networks, then we, we cannot expect this. This is the main bottleneck now preventing this infrastructure from being used for social applications. So um, it's, it's a, a very worthwhile pursuit for everyone in this space. Taylor, maybe you want to add something? Yeah, it's, I, I, ag I agree they, um, you know, the civil tests or, or, or what's it called? Civil, uh, civil resistance. Civil resistance, yeah, uh, is a really important thing to, to solve. Uh, and there, I think there are various kinds of algorithmic ways you can do it once we sta start having enough data around it. But in the short term, we also have these things called governments who can actually um, also help out on some of these. And, and uh, they are, <laughs> whether, you, whether you like them or not, whether you trust them or not, they are able to do this in some level, some, some aspect. Uh, so getting a lot of this Can I challenge this? <laughs> Go ahead. Well, yes. <laughs> right now we have, uh, you know, over a billion people that don't have access to to identity, and 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 then we have the question of what do you do when when institutions are not there? How how do you provide identity for for this uh, class of people? So uh, and also for not only governments, but what if you are in a country that is. Uh, that was torn by war and, and you have no institutions that can validate you, not your school, not your former uh, employer, uh, then, then what kind of solutions do you, could you have there? Yeah, no, I, I, I don't know the answer. No, 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 it, this, 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 is, this, is a, this is a very, very good point. So the, the government identity aspect of it, I think is something that works in some countries, in some places, even in some cases, some parts of some countries. But it is, it is definitely not a universal solution for it. But I do think there are a lot of really interesting constructs that we can do around identity when we start actually removing the government-issued identity as the primary identifier. So, and so I, sp I spend a lot of time in, in Africa and in Latin America. And there are, are most, like, Africa is really interesting because I mean, it depends country to country, but a lot of countries, they do not have strong national identity systems, even though many people have in many foreign groups, NGOs, have been pushing these. It's the same, they also don't have high levels of banked people. And there are many, many theories from people who aren't from Africa about why this happens. It is typically that we need to give them access. But the real problem is that these technologies that are being pushed on top of them from, uh, onto them by the World Bank, by Bill and Melinda, Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation and all of these actually do not really relate to people. And they already have existing institutions. There are existing trust frameworks. There are existing identity frameworks. Every single African country has a very, very good identity <laughs> system. And they are very localized. They are very much around their tribe, around the village, all of these kinds of things. And these are 
basically, it's kind of like a, a, a graph, right? You know, you can actually start modeling these kinds of things. And I think this is where we need to start looking to solve some of these kind of things. Like, I'm definitely not a fan on pushing national identity systems on top of, of, of these countries because they are really, they're irrelevant. So even if they're pushed, they, people t tend to ignore them. They might go use it if they want to, but uh, like on our team, we have a couple of people from Nigeria and, with, um, and they have a, I think it's a MasterCard sponsored yeah, national, I yeah. Yeah. <laughs> national identity system. With your identity and, and it was like widely, you know, spread like in the news and the, all the identity and payment people, oh yeah, Nigeria now has a MasterCard branded national identity system. The only problem is no one wants it. Right, and no one uses it, no one goes to apply for it because it's a pain in the ass, this doesn't do anything for me. This, this is like a project that was done to make MasterCard make whichever funding organization and some government official look good. It has zero function for an actual, for real citizens, right? And this is, this is where your point is very well taken. So you, we can use government I identity as ways of bootstrapping systems in places where they work. Other places, I think there are many other interesting ways we can we can do it. Mm -hmm. So we're, we're basically at sort of question time. I don't know if you want to add one more thing before we open it up to. I just would like to add uh, a small correction. As I mean, when I'm talking about on-chain profiles, I'm not talking about like uh, like upload your image into the blockchain. Or it's more about you know you ha you create a, an, an account that you can attach information to. Means you could reference in information. You could reference a hash of an image, you could reference, uh, you could add a nickname, you could reference a reputation system. The, the, pro the difference is really more on a technical basis. Right now, when we have purely public keys on chain, we have no way to attach any information to it, and the security is means like, you know, take care, you back up the key, if you lose the key, everything is gone. If you replace this with a smart kind of based account according to the 7 to 5 spec, um, you have an account now that you can attach, for example, a statement, a verifiable claim on chain, which says K KYC verified or, or a credit investor or whatever, and then you are one of like 100,000 other addresses that have the same claim. Um, and that may, may, or like maybe, uh, you know, claim is human. <laughs> and now it can actually participate in certain uh, activities. So it's, it's not about creating your identity. You know, like Pelle also said, like identity is a set of a lot of different personas and like the elephant uh, tail, you know, I mean, only if you combine all the pictures, you get the actual picture. If you combine all the pieces, you get the actual picture. I mean, I don't think that anybody's um, Instagram account is that person. <laughs> Very likely not, you know. Uh, if you go then uh, meet her in person or him in person, you might be surprised how <laughs> different looking these people can be. Um, so it's like always different pieces, but I think we do need uh, a different way of how we do on-chain accounts. And whatever form they will take, um, that's kind of like up up to, to people of how they will use it. I'm pretty certain people also will put a lot of information uh, on their accounts, which might be even personal to some extent, and that's probably not even preventable. Um, but I think we need tools like blockchain pruning, for example, to actually prevent that it stays forever there, even if that person changed their mind later. <laughs> I, I just want to add a note uh, that, yes, I agree, and we're, uh, we intend to, at Democracy Earth, we intend to be working with the ERC 725 standard, which you created, and precisely it's going to have an authentication called is human. That's it. That's the idea. If we're able to verify humans, um, so 100% on, on the same page there. Yeah. Okay. Can we? Oh, you want to? <laughs> we gotta let them ask questions. Yeah, you want to say one thing? <laughs> okay. Does anybody have any questions? <laughs> I can't do that. Sorry, forever asking questions. Uh, two, two questions there. One, what do you think of Humanity DAO? And two, there is obviously loads and loads of data out there. It exists in the Web2 world. Uh, in a sense, do you have a uh, problem with using that to then feed Web3 identity solutions? Well, about Humanity DAO, if I can 
talk about it. I think it's a really, 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 really bad idea. And um, and <laughs> and seeing all of these people people tweeting out their addresses with their you know tokens and all of this kind of stuff, like encouraging people to do this, it's really dumb and irresponsible. And this is one of these kinds of things where GDPR eventually will come in. And I think within the next year, maybe two, we'll see the first DAP developer who's done something really as dumb as that, that will be charged as a GDPR controller and get a big fine in the EU. Yeah. W one sentence explanation, please. I was supposed to do a podcast with the creator and I decided not to do it because of exactly the reason Pele talked about. So uh, they don't have uh, any idea where to get the money and you're supposed to verify that you're a human. It was a great growth hack and they have some funding. They're giving people one die or one dollar per month. Mm, I mean, there's nothing more really to it. Maybe I can explain it um, from the first principle, which is just that this is quite complicated. Um, a bunch of people verify each other to exist basically in a database uh, that's otherwise decentralized and not owned by anything. They've, the verify mechanisms are things like Twitter, uh, as you said, um, but people stake their claim to be a human and people can challenge those stakes so people will lose money if they're not actually humans as regarded by the rest of the group who've already entered that group. The incentive for joining it was one dollar, I think, basically, or something like that. One die, wasn't it? Or was it like pay out every month, right? So it's minimal. But then you end up with a registry of verified humans. And then once you have that, then you can do interesting things attached to Ethereum addresses. Is that a better explanation of what it was? Does that make sense? Yeah, and I, I think that people use um, Twitter to to demonstrate to the community uh, yeah, the yeah, who they were. Um, I. I it was a project, it, it got really popular a few months ago, and I think I recently read a post-mortem. <laughs> um, what I will say is that I, I think the, the main goal of the project was to test a couple theories, a couple assumptions, and that, I, li I like the spirit of that, and I, and I think that it is important to do a couple, uh, to experiment with the game theoretic uh, constraints and, and with incentives that can lead to some kind of cohesion in, in validating each other. Of course, that was a very primitive experiment, uh, <coughs> but it's th I like the, the direction and I like the spirit of it. I will say that. I heard, I mean, it's the first time I hear uh, about it. Um, so, Pelle, just to understand, your concern is people putting their addresses public and say, hey, that's me. So it's, it's kind of like the, the one one name, you know, where you register your Bitcoin blockchain, uh, your Bitcoin address, you know, based on Twitter and Facebook, I guess, was a very similar thing. That's what, like four years ago? Yeah. Uh, Blockstack now, yeah. Yeah, well, one, one, whatever it was called, one name or one. Yeah, no, no, I mean, there was before a system uh, where you had to register your Bitcoin address. Um, I mean, I mean, I would say like it allows for very interesting experimentation. Um, I do think we can't prevent that people will put their addresses out there. And uh, the, qu the question is, is the address you're putting out there now the one you also pay your personal things with and you invest in your ICOs and all the other things? I mean, that's where it gets problematic. If you really want, I mean, any address you get from somebody, so you get paid by somebody, you look at his address, you just make a little graph, and you know all of the other 20 addresses, and you can like watch them all day long. I mean, we already have that problem by design on the chain. So uh, it's not going necessarily away. The, the question probably is, or your critic would probably be, do we want to foster that <laughs> <laughs> behavior? Uh, yeah. uh, I, 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 uh, I, th I mean, I, I also believe experimentation is good, but one of the real problems with the humanity DAO is, is something that I see as a huge problem in the Ethereum community, in the Ethereum world, is that we're still using these, you know, basic um, abstractions for, for identity, for on-chain identity, for interacting with the chain, the same ones that we did four or five years ago, right? You know, the original, JSON RPC, which is a clone of the like the Bitcoin JSON RPC with the provider way interface. Better, way better, 
<laughs> it's, no, so it's, and I think this, this whole abstraction makes it so easy to do really, really bad things. And there's very, very little interest I see in the Ethereum community to actually fix some of these things. A lot of people like Wallet Connect are doing some interesting things to try and fix it in 2.0. Um, and I think this is really important to do, but there has been very little interest for people who are way more focused on, on the cool stuff, like the really advanced tokenomics, all the quadratic this, that, the other thing, all of these kinds of things, it's just cool to work with, but the most basic funda funda fundamental thing that all of us are building on is broken and encourages this really bad one address, you know, put all my activity for my one MetaMask, my primary MetaMask address. Right. Yeah, well, I mean, but it's also really tricky. I mean, the, the solution in the Bitcoin world was HD wallets. Um, and um, I mean, the, the problem is if I can't use the same wallet across multiple devices easily, then people aren't using it. And, and nobody's trans, I mean, you know, once you put your money on a ledger, you just don't touch it anymore. Like you don't take that thing out just in case. So it means your activity is zero except if you're one MetaMask account, where you exactly use all the time the same address. Um, so, I mean, uh, it's kind of like a, a tricky balance. So I think, yes, for private activity, yeah, we should have more tools to kind of like distribute, uh, uh, you know, funds and, and, and use different accounts. Um, I think also using relay transactions would help with that because then, um, you know, you don't send the, the, the ether from your one address to the other just to be able to do something on the other address. Uh, because that's easy to track. Um, but I also think there is the need for public personas where you want the visibility. You want, for example, if you have a charity and this charity has a smart contract based identity, you want to see what's going on, you know, what they did, what did they, did, what they fund, uh, you know, you, you want to have the identity of a company that maybe created items, you know, think of a, a brand issuing or pr producing products and verifying the authenticity of those products. Um, or, you know, even just uh, a musician or any other kind of public persona who wants to, like, say, hey, I did this, you know, I may be maybe participated in this, I funded that. And right now in Ethereum, everything is money because of ESC20, but, I mean, I think it will go more and more into there. They're also kitties. Hmm? They're also kitties. They're also kitties, also because of <laughs> ESC20. <Very important. laughs> but, I mean, I think uh, um, it will go more into you know, the less monetary things, um, a more like reputational basis uh, and tokenization. Um, we were talking before about uh, how whenever uh, there's this, this Black Mirror episode that many of you might have seen where people are just, uh, you have this <laughs> overwhelming reputation system and it has dire consequences and it has kind of, uh, it sits at our collective imagination of what a distributed reputation system could look like. And we don't have an opposite uh, vision that is not horrible um, to, to demonstrate that, to demonstrate having entities validating each other and giving each other credentials in a way that doesn't lead to um, to mass manipulation or you know co being completely driven to optimize your own score. So one challenge I think for radical exchange, especially as uh, it concerns artists, is I think to, to help us envision what this reality could look like in, in a positive way, because I think that we collectively lack that and, and we definitely have the dystopian view very clear in our minds. But I, I would like to add to this is dystopian. Um, pers I mean, for example, if I look at uh, Black Mirror, right? I mean, I could take almost every episode and see the positive side of it. I mean, they just turned it into the negative side. And, and uh, you want someone to like something. You know, um, and, and the thing is, it's, it's always like this. Any tool can be used for good and bad. It ba it's it's d based on the intent and what people use it for. I mean. Like, you know, people can like s use these bottles to hit other people too, you know, or drink, <laughs> or drink from it. Um, but I mean, uh, I think on the end, like we, we do have to experiment and we do obviously have to think like what are kind of like the positive or the negative effects, but on the end it will depend on people. 
uh, how, how good or bad does an effect is. And yes, I mean, all the things we always discuss, it's kind of like if we would have the, the perfect distributed decentralized tool plus super private and selective disclosure, we would be all better off. The thing is we have to work with what we have <laughs> and kind of like try to you know, uh, balance things. And another thing from a developer's perspective, even if we build the most super duper things, the, the most things that get adopted are simple and they're easy to understood. They're transparent enough and simple enough built so that you want to adopt them. Nobody will adopt the super black box with hugely complex, complex protocols inside if they don't understand it. So we do have to learn step by step and gradually as, as a community as well. So I, th I think that's our time up, right? Okay, so sorry, you don't get any more questions. But you can find these people later and ask them questions. Thank you very much to all of you. Thank you.